Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by Faithful for the Faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Well, it's Oilers are above 500 night, so I'm good. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you're above 500, they must be in a playoff spot, right? They must be. They must be. Let me just look at the standings here. So they uh, they gutted out a 3-2 victory over the Ottawa Senators, Bruce. Mm -hmm. And they've won all four of their games against the Senators, and they now sit tied with Winnipeg. Oh, no, they're in third place, Bruce. 16 points for the Oilers, 15 for the Jets, but the Jets have... Four Seven games, games, games in hand. Or four, something. No. 700 games in hand. Four games in hand. Calgary, uh, so Calgary's got at 11. Calgary's also got four games in hand, but they're five points behind. So maybe they play Ottawa, though, on a well, run of games coming they up. Play, they play each other tonight, Winnipeg and Calgary. So all we can desperately hope for is that somebody all wins it in regulation. No Batman points. That's my motto for this entire season. No Batman points. I hate the loser points myself. <laughs> especially in the Canadian division. Mm -hmm. So the Oilers are two points behind the Montreal Canadiens, and uh, they, but Montreal has three games in hand, but they, nonetheless within striking distance of the Montreal Canadiens. So uh, some good news all around. Bruce, they've even their goal differential on the year, 52 for, 52 against. So the, the Oilers, uh, mainly by playing the Ottawa Centers four times out of the last five games, but listen, they did it. They won all four of those games. And that's Something. that was a tall order. Tall order to beat any team um, that much in a row. And they did it. So that's, you know, they swept the series against the Senators. So that was really fantastic. Bruce, we're good. it's our two good things, two bad things, mm -hmm. and two numbers podcast. We're going to go with two good things each because it was an Oilers win. Um, okay, win. we'll dig deep. I don't. I don't have to dig deep. I, there was so much good in that game. There was. There was good things. There, there, there's. There's winning ugly, which I'm in favor of, and then there's winning but ugly, which that was. That really <laughs> was. So the last after Matt Murray came in, it was like two different teams. Oh that, God, that, that played like Ottawa completely owned the, the 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 possession play and the zone play and everything else for the last 35 minutes or whatever it was after Oilers made it three one. And Mikko Koskinen stood very tall, uh -huh. and uh, they had uh, uh, just a, a very, very unusual game all the way around that I'm sure we're going to dig into as we uh, move ahead here. What's your first good thing, Bruce? Yeah, well, I'm, let's start with one of those things. Let's, uh, let's call it scoring from unusual sources. And those sources being the three defensemen that all found twine for Edmonton tonight. Uh, mind you, three three defensemen noted for their offensive ability, but they actually all put the puck in the net tonight. Darnell Nurse, Evan Bouchard, Tyson Berry, uh, all from distance, and all against a very, very shaky Marcus Hogberg. Thank you, C.J. Smith, for starting him tonight. Uh, if, uh, if, Isn't uh, it D.J. Smith? D.J. Smith, yes, you're right. And if oh, yeah, uh, Matt Murray had started this game, Ottawa would have won it 2 nothing. Is my take. Uh, anyway, um, it was um, uh, Hogberg, who doesn't seem to know where his net is, behind him. Man, he's been floating all over the place, even outside the posts and stuff. You know, Dry Settle got an ugly one on oh. him last week and, and tonight. Anyway, thank he's you, horrible. DJ Smith, for, uh, for, for that. Um, anyway, the three defensemen scored. And of the orders who got their who got the assists on the goal, we have Josh Archibald with his first of the season, Alex Chason with his first assist of the season, Devin Shore with his first assist of the season, and Jujar Kara with his second and third assists of the season. And nowhere to be seen anywhere on this score sheet are the names of Edmonton Stars, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Kyler Yamamoto. In fact, each of their top, uh, uh, the top two lines went minus one and did nothing on the power play. And Oilers still won anyway, which is about as topsy-turvy as it can get for uh, fans of the Edmonton or Oilers. Uh, Oilers yeah. just do not win games this way. So the bright side and the big bright spotlight side is somehow they found a game a way to win a game in which neither of their stars were really on their game. I loved the Evan Bouchard goal Bruce it's the kind mm -hmm. of goal 
that uh, Bouchard is going to score repeatedly in his mm-hmm. NHL career. Um, you know, that's that that shot that he finds a way to get through to the net, mm-hmm. uh, the Brent Burns kind of shot. And I, I call yep. I call this the uh, Evan Bouchard dividend. It's he's he he pays better dividends right now than a pipeline stock. He he's just going to he's going to leak he, those those goals that they haunted the Oilers forever playing other, against other teams. And I, I'm sure in previous years, the previous 10 years, Bruce, the Oilers have been at least it's doubled. The other team has got at least twice as many of those kind of point shot goals than the Oilers have got for them in the last decade. In fact, Edmonton's had a unique inability to ever score that kind of goal. Mm-hmm. And but we're the Oilers are going to score that kind of goal now. Jones, Caleb Jones is good at that shot. Slater Cuckoo is good at that shot, and Evan Bouchard is, I think, going to prove himself to be a master, exceptional at, at that kind of shot. So uh, Paul like Coffey that. used to get him in the second part of his Oilers career after he'd been around four or five years, and he'd sort of filed away his big slap shot and started getting into these ones where he'd be moving across the blue line and he just. He flex his wrists and they float one through everybody and the goalie be like, what? And it's already in the net, right? And just, and that's exactly what Bouchard did there. He, he held it. He moved the shooting angle. <laughs> he let fly at a moment the goalie wasn't expecting it into his screen. And it was in the net. And that's, that's so a goal scorer's goal, David. I, I, I see Evan Bouchard as a double-digit goal scorer from the blue line. In sort of a standard year for him, as, uh, and, and tonight style against style uh, player, he is, yeah, he was also solid defensively tonight. Mm-hmm. I mean, he didn't make we didn't have him as making one major mistake on a great chance against. He wasn't to blame on that breakaway goal that was on Slater Cuckoo, mm-hmm. and uh, possibly Leon Drysaddle. But uh, no, that was a just a great game, <laughs> solid game at least, probably a seven, a good game from Bouchard and. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll I'll go to my good thing. So I, Miko Koskinen was people were prepared to run him out of town on a rail. What does that mean? Run him out of town on a rail? Uh, but th- do you know what it means? I'm not sure if it means on a train or under a train. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the way people were uh, carrying on. And uh, to his credit, Dave Tippett defended the goalie. You know, saying he's been in a hard place and has played okay, played well. I think even. And and he hasn't been terrible, Bruce. He just hasn't come up with enough big saves at key moments. And again, um, I was getting that feeling a little bit tonight. You know, the first grade A shot goes in. It's a tough shot. It's a tip shot shot in the slot. And I'm thinking, oh no, like it, you got to make you got to stop some of these grade A shots because he's been consistently outplayed by the other team's goalie all year. But tonight, Miko Koskinen outplayed obviously outplayed uh, the Ottawa starter and. And um, he, I think he kind of stole the game for the Oilers. I think it's fair to say there were some good performances by other players, but the Oilers uh, were out chanced thirteen to nine for Grade A chances by Ottawa. That's and there's all, two eh? two particular sequences I want to focus on. There's the ten minutes of terror late in the second period when Yesapulia Yarvi. Uh, got sucked over to the wrong point and allowed. So his man walked right into the slot. It was Shabbat mm-hmm. fired it on net. And then there was, I think it was uh, Derek Stepan who, who jumped on the rebound and pounded in like, just like go- a shot that should have been a goal. Mm-hmm. And then I'm not sure exactly what happened on the third one. It might've been Lagos and putting it, trying to put it back uh, into Koskinen's glove or pads, but a stick, a, a stick enters the screen and pushes the puck almost over the goal line and Koskinen keeps it out. And it could be an Ottawa sticker. It could be an Edmonton stick. The, re, the replay to me is indeterminate, but that was with, within 10 seconds, really within five seconds. That was three, f- five, five alarm chances or one grade A chance of two, five alarm chances. And Koskinen held his ground. The, the other period I want to focus on is the last two minutes of the game where there was a couple grade A chances as well. Uh, Tyson Berry coughs it up. <laughs> trying to loft. I'm thinking, hey, that's a good play. Loft the puck out. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it good goes to, I think it was execute. Paul. Yeah. And a, a, slot, a dangerous slot shot. And then there was another one in tight uh, shortly thereafter. 
And then there was, there, but there was other shots as well in that sequence, kind of outside shots where he gave up no rebound, where he sucked in the puck. Koskinen was very sharp, very, very freaking sharp, Bruce, in those final two minutes. And it was so good to see that because oh, that's yeah. the goalie that we saw last year. And maybe there's some magic with Mike Smith back in the lineup where he, he's going to be prodded and uh, and cajoled and or encouraged whatever Mike Smith yeah. does perhaps to, to, to play his whole game. But way to go, Miko Koskinen. That was a great game. He responded to Mike Smith playing a good game by playing a good game of his own. And maybe that's the kind of competition that he needs, you know, and, and yeah. being the guy that's expected to carry the whole load. Like he, he's had uh, a couple of opportunities like that in the past and that, you know, has, has not, done real well over the long term at least. I mean, remember the year they traded Cam Talbot, he started 24 out of 25. And uh, that was, uh, that gradually uh, uh, got to be not good. Uh, anyway, he did, especially second game in a row, when he gives up a goal in the opening minute for the second game in a row on the first shot on net, and you're going, here we go. Cam Talbot, uh, really, 2017, 18. Remember Cam Talbot's run of first yeah, letting he had in. like 13 oh, or God. something on the year. Anyway, it was uh, from then to the end of the game, he had 41 more shots and only uh, Jenny the D- D- yeah, on a clear Dadanoff. cut breakaway. Uh, clear cut breakaway. Uh, <laughs> with a two goal lead. How does that happen? Cuckoo anyway, was that, just uh, that was the only like a, one that got that got he got a big piece of that one, but uh, he came up with some big stops. And his rebound control, I thought, wasn't great early in the game, but late in the game, it was outstanding. Yeah. And there was one where the guy had a clean shot, kind of right into his into his body, you know, between it, just above his knees. And there was two sends parked on the doorstep with Nary and Euler in between them, and uh, somehow. Uh, Koskinen was able to squeeze those knees together and hold that puck that there was no rebound. Because he lost the rebound to either side, it was going in the net. And so that was a, that was a huge, and it wasn't like, you know, he caught it with his glove or anything. Like he had to smother that, that hard wrist shot with all kinds of traffic and around him. So that, that was a, I'm not sure we'd call it a grade A chance by our strict definition, but boy, that was a big save all the same. Yeah, at the end of the game, any shot that's grade B, any shot on net starts to get very scary and and mm-hmm. uh, can go in, as we Euler fans know, having seen Edmonton play the mm-hmm. Mighty Ducks in the playoffs. Um, Bruce, what's your next good thing? Oh, I'm going to specifically, of, of the unlikely scorers, I uh, have to single out Jujar Kara. Uh, an order that's had uh, uh, oh, what somebody said the other day more lives than 19 cats <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can understand why the team likes him and wants to keep giving him chances so let's let's say let's start there and why they like him and want to keep giving him chances is because he is capable of playing games like he did tonight which was a, a very strong two-way game uh, assists. Uh, I think, yeah, he, he made a, a, a nice assist on the first goal. It was a terrible goal to give up by the goalie, but boy, it's three beauty passes that led to that first goal. A breakout pass by Barry to Kara, uh, <clears throat> a real sharp sort of 20 footer right on the stick, so he was able to bolt out of his own zone. And then Kara made this long cross ice backhand fee that found uh, Ennis steaming over the, the offensive blue line. And then Ennis made a smart drop pass back to Nurse for the one-timer. And I mean, the shot should have been stopped, but the, the play that led to it was, you know, real good sort of 200-foot movement of the puck with Kara in the middle of it. And then the second point was just a simple face-off win uh, that resulted in the Bouchard goal. But I liked a lot of his plays. I liked his, his penalty killing uh, when the Oilers got their one penalty of the night, but it was a four-minute penalty and one of their main penalty killers Josh Archibald was the guy who took it so that was a tough sequence for the oil and they they really got through the first three minutes unscathed and then the last minute was sort of hanging on by the fingernails to get through the PK but uh, Kara's part in that was excellent and then uh, just I liked his game in transition I liked his physical game I liked uh, I liked a whole lot about Jujar Kara's game tonight uh and the only thing I didn't like was, you know, he did have a couple of great chances, but he missed the net on both of them. 
little, yeah. little sharper shooting on those. He probably would have had a goal to go with those two apples. I don't think we think we can. Yeah, fair enough. We, he's never going to be a sniper, but he looked like in his in his early days coming out of the AHL and as a young NHLer, he looked like he could be a very solid kind of third line two way mm -hmm. player. Like that would be his ceiling. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been plagued with inconsistency, especially defensive lapses, especially puck handling errors in the defensive zone. Uh, in his young career, still young career, he's in mid career now, I guess. And um, but he just seems to be settling down and, and going for it, playing smarter defensive hockey and good good for Jujar Kara. Bruce, uh, three so three good games in a row for Kara and four for my second good thing, which is yes, Apulia Yarvi. Um, he did make the mistake that I noted earlier on uh, that that's 10 seconds of terror sequence. Mm -hmm. But he 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 played just enough so four good games in a row for for Yessa. He's flying out there. He's skating hard. He's hitting people. He's using his body. And that's kind of a little bit terrifying for the opposition wow. when a big guy like that thumps you. Like, he he can really uh, make an impression on other players when he gets going that way. He also had two fantastic offensive sequences. On one play, he passed the puck cross seam in the offensive zone to Darnell Nurse for what was oh, a five-alarm chance and should have probably could have been a goal very easily. And uh, in the third period, McDavid uh, centered the puck and Puglia Yarvi got, got an in tight jam shot on net. So, mm -hmm. so uh, he could have, and there was a couple other chances where he came close on one timers. I don't think they hit the net, those shots, or uh, they got blocked. But I just think he's playing very well. Yeah, making good, good plays with the puck, too, just, you know, in, in the neutral zone or, you know, along the walls or whatever, making, making, uh, Good smart passes and, and positive plays with the puck. There was another play he made uh, where the uh, where he looped back into his own zone, and you're going, oh no no, don't do the Messier, and and because they had full possession in the in the neutral <laughs> zone, and he took it all the way back behind his own net, but he actually had full control of it and 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 took some time off the clock and came cruising out the other side and and you know just helped while away, and this was fairly late laid in the going, you know, so it was, uh, it was, uh, just, the, just showing some composure and I, I see that coming on to his game increasingly. And that is absolutely gigantic really for any young player, but especially for one with the high end skill with this guy's got. Yeah. It's kind of what Kara needs. I think is it's composure, confidence. Mm -hmm. Those, those are the words that, and, and, um, Scott and it's right almost, now. it's it's like an attitude of, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to play my best. And uh, mm -hmm. they're both doing it. Bruce, it's time to move on to our bad things. Mm -hmm. should almost have music to play so we'll move on to the bad things. But we're not that technically astute. At least uh, I'm not, I, I'm kind of the producer of this. And I don't know how to do that kind of thing. So, uh, but what's your bad thing? I'm going to save your favorite it. bad thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to pick on one play that sort of marginally involves your bad thing, I think, and, okay. and that is the the breakaway goal that uh, Ottawa got in the first, basically, shift of the third period. 3-1 lead, you're coming out to, you know, let's sort of take charge of this thing and just, you know, like what they did last night with a one-goal lead, they had a two-goal lead. You know, just own the puck, get it deep, don't make any mistakes. Well, they got it deep, and then nobody covered anybody. And Matt Murray made a good pass. I'm sure he got an assist on the play, and indeed he did, to Mike Riley. And Riley made a, a excellent, perfect uh, stretch pass to Dadanoff at the far blue line. But there was nobody anywhere defensively. Like Drysaddle was out of the out of the sort of line of the pass where you think he might be. Uh, the defenseman Slater Kukuk is up at center. I mean, it's one of those things where you could, it might show up on that Twitter account. You had one job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Not let yeah. anybody get behind you, let alone yeah, on a, a sniper. By, and it was perfect timing by Ottawa. And I'll give Ottawa a ton of credit. I thought they played their hearts out in this game. They really brought down three to one, and you'd think, oh, man, we're dead. And they just brought it, and they brought it, and they brought it, and they, they were thumping Edmonton. Uh, this is neither a good nor a bad thing, but 
apparently Edmonton out hit Ottawa twenty eight to twenty seven, but if you count the hard hits, I bet you it was like ten to two for Ottawa. They were really nailing Oilers, and and it had an effect. And I think Edmonton was getting a, I won't say shy around the puck, but they were losing puck battles, and Ottawa was winning them. It's funny because you so. and I had been uh, singing. Uh, we we during the game, Bruce and I go back and forth on the scoring chances, and we discuss them and grade them and try to get them right by the end of the game. And we were both commenting that Cuckoo had been playing very well about halfway through the second period, both remarking on it. And I mentioned that I thought he was out playing Caleb Jones, who I uh, like as a player. I think that's a fair comment. But <laughs> we, may, we may see Caleb Jones in the lineup, Bruce. That was a pretty ghastly mistake. No, maybe it's just like a, it was like a beer league hockey mistake. It's the kind of mistake I make when I'm playing defensive beer league hockey. It's like, oh, well, he got behind me. Uh, Especially no, on I'm, the penalty kill. Or Cuckoo, that's where Cuckoo is in the lineup and Jones is not because Jones had a couple of fails on yeah. the penalty kill. And Cuckoo yeah. uh, was in the lineup. Tippett more or less specifically said that uh, it was uh, he needed a guy on the penalty kill and thus Cuckoo drew in when Russell went out and uh, Jones did not. But during that four-minute penalty kill, Kukuk had one shift where he was doing everything. He blocked a shot. He tipped another one he, out, out of uh, harm's way. He made a good play to clear the zone when they have been under quite a bit of pressure, you know, and, and uh, uh, got the job done. But he sure had a fail on that. He's not going to get a failing grade from me, but he's going to no. get a minus one for that play. For sure. And I think his six will turn into a five because yeah. of that. That one play. I might take a seven and turn it into a five. Mm -hmm. That might be a minus two kind of play, honestly, yeah, okay. given the the uh, the, the magnitude of the yes, hour. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the magnitude of just the uh, not happened. just the mistake, but also the timing of it. It's got it's like a ten on both. You can't do that level yeah. of mistake and timing of mistake. He maxed it out. He got ninety nine out of a hundred. Uh, well, probably that's not true because in the last minute of a game, mistakes are even worse. All right, um, Bruce, my bad thing is Leon Dreisaitl's defensive play. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's being hailed right now as this two-way ace. Yep. And honestly, Bruce, I don't see it. I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing Connor McDavid actually playing better defensive hockey than Leon Dreisaitl right now. And in this game, including that play where he didn't cut off the, the cross-seam pass up the middle of the ice, which is kind of the... the the, the guy, the high man's job in, in that situation. Um, he made five major mistakes on Grady chances against this game, which is a, which is a kind of a massive number for any player on the team. Mm -hmm. A center's going to make maybe one a game, maybe two, but if he's making five, he's not having a very good game defensively. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing from dry saddle this year, I've remarked on it before is freelancing, wandering on defense, kind of trying to read the play outsmart the play cheat for offense, get a, stick on uh, the pass. get a stick on the pass, kind of play zone defense rather than cover, rather than get down low and help out those defensemen down low and cover the defensive slot. And McDavid is doing that diligently, I find. I think he's playing his best two-way hockey. Uh, Gaetan Haas does that super extra diligently. But Dreisaitl is, he's, he does his own, a little bit of his own thing out there on defense. And tonight it, it really uh, almost cost his team. And I'm going to look at one play in particular, the la last minute of the game, where the, they lose the puck on the boards. McDavid's battling on the boards. Nurse is battling on the boards. And they, Ottawa comes out Larson. with it. And Larson's in front of the net. And All there's right. two, Ottawa, two Ottawa Senators attacking the net. And the only two players there are Larson and Dreisaitl. But Dreisaitl's too high in the defensive zone. Mm -hmm. He's just, he's not down between his man and the net and they get a grade A chance because of him as much as anything. You could, no, Larson also to blame, Nurse also to blame, they lost battles. But really Dreisaitl was just out of the picture. He missed an assignment in the last minute of the game. I, th I think it was a huge mental error, but it's typical of the kind of mental errors that he's making. Over the year, over the year so far in 15 games, Bruce at even strength, uh, McDavid has made 18 major mistakes on grade A chances against um, Kyle Turris has made 16 in about half the minutes. So I think like he's in a different category. McDavid 18, but Dreisaitl's made 23. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't been punished with a lot of goals against yet. I, I think it's he's had some good puck luck. 
and that's that explains uh, somewhat his high plus minus. But he is going to get caught on this if he doesn't start to bear down and stop freelancing, stop wandering, and just do what he's supposed to do: cover cover off the defensive slot diligently. And um, that's my take. Yeah, well, on that play, he got the good goaltending for sure, but uh, Miko Koskinen so had that play covered. There was no chance that puck was going in the net because Koskinen played it perfectly, and he had his pad hard against the post, and there was simply nowhere for the puck to go. But it was a close-in close, close in hammered shot. But you know, it, So yeah. we would call it a grade-A chance, but really, I mean, it's a grade-A chance for the goalie. He kind of made the save in advance because he was so well-positioned. Yeah. Kachuk had nowhere to put it but right into his pad. But still, it was a couple of nervous moments there in the last 35 minutes of the game, but especially the last down the stretch. Um, where are we, Bruce? Are you up to my number, I think? Okay. I got a beauty tonight. Uh, this is Dominic Cahoon's. Corsi, shot attempts at even strength when he's on the ice, which was 13 minutes and 46 seconds. For the Oilers, zero. For the Senators, 19. And when you convert that to actual shots on goal, we have a slightly less dramatic Oilers, zero. Go figure. Senators, 11. The Oilers got outshot 11 nothing with Dominic Cahoon on the ice tonight. And it wasn't much better for any of his line mates. Uh, uh, Kyler Yamamoto was two shots for, 12 against. Leon Dreisaitl was three shots for, 13 against. And Cahoon was 0 and 11. So, of course, the 0 is going to catch my eye every time. So he gets the number. But really, the whole line had just a terrible time of it tonight. Yeah. I uh, wonder if they might move Tyler Ennis up to that line, move... Uh... Maybe one of the Cahoon might come off for a game or so. We'll see what happens there. I'll say uh, this about Leon Drysaddle though tonight. And I saw this last night. Nobody said anything about it on the broadcast, or they briefly did on the broadcast. He got smashed in the mouth with a stick. There were uh, thirty seconds to go in the game last night, and the go the net was empty and the puck came to him and he, he made a play but he was on his way to the bench and at the end of the game they briefly scanned the Oilers bench and Drysaddle was hunched over with his helmet right on the boards holding his face and I, I was worried at the time that you know who knows like I didn't you couldn't really see how how he got hit but he clearly did and he was clearly in trouble and then tonight there was a little thing between beginning of the second period and they focused on Leon on the bench for about 10 or 15 seconds and he was adjusting his mouth guard and he was trying to make his mouth guard fit and I had an idea that he got he just got smashed in the mouth and he just wasn't feeling good like that, that and he didn't play good like that is not his game like last night he was the best player on the ice tonight he was close to the worst and I'm just wondering if there's just some kind of a a physical thing there. I mean, we can ask our colleague Kurt Levins how it feels to have it getting smashed in the mouth after undergoing dental surgery yesterday. And I, I, I that that thing on the bench, and I was watching for it because I'd seen the original incident last night, and they just had this one sort of extended thing, and he was just, and he was, he didn't look happy, and it was looking like he couldn't make his mouth guard fit. So I think he probably got a, a little bit of a cave in in the dental area or something, something. Something to miss that didn't force him to miss the game or anything else, but it didn't. Uh, uh, whatever it was, he was way off his game. Poor guy. That's uh, yeah. that can't be. That's not fun. Oh. Uh, Bruce, my number. Of course, I could use this as a segue to to complain about the Oilers line combinations again, but I, I I'm going to do it in a different way. Okay. I I think uh, Nugent Hopkins is kind of miscast this year as a sniper, mm -hmm. and. Um, so my number is one. And the, McDavid and Nugent Hopkins have played together 15 games now at even strength here. How many times has Connor McDavid set up Ryan Nugent Hopkins for a goal at even strength this year? Once. Once. Wow. And that's 15 games. And McDavid's in the category of the, you could be a fire hydrant and you would score goals with Connor McDavid. Mm -hmm. Ryan Nugent Hopkins is a great offensive hockey player, or at least a good one. He's certainly a very good one, yeah. He's just got one goal. So what's going on? That's the mystery. Well, Bruce, he has 18 
grade A chances uh, at even strength. Um, grade A shots, I should say. That's a lot of shots. That's, his, that's the same rate or a higher rate than Leon Dreisaitl had last year. That is a lot of grade A shots at even strength. He has scored one other goal at even strength set up by Kyler Yamamoto. Mm-hmm. So he's got the two goals. But um, he's not able to convert. And so the question is, is this just, ba- this could be, he's getting the chances, he's getting the looks, he's getting great looks. He had another one tonight. Breakaway shot, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and he missed. He, or the, the, the goalie made the save. And um, so the question is, why isn't it? Is it just bad puck luck? So that's, what do you think? Is it just bad puck? Are the goals going to start coming? Because he is getting the great shots on net. Generally, he misses the net quite a bit too. But what's your take? Well, yes, it's a little, he's going to start getting more goals than he has been getting. I mean, one out of 18. That isn't yeah. going to continue. Uh, what I'm seeing is a slight hesitation from when he receives the pass to when he releases the shot. And it's pucks on his st- stick. He controls it. He looks. He shoots. And there, there's no real sort of one time. Just fire right away before the goalie can get across there. And th- that you see from the great finishers that shoot right before the goalie's ready. And Nuge always has that little delay in between taking. Not all, not quite always, but almost always has that delay between time he takes the pass and by the time he releases the shot and these are NHL goalies and most of them are pretty good you know give or take uh, our man Hogberg here uh, Marcus Hog- Hogberg they call him now Hogberg anyway yeah he, yeah, there you go <laughs> he played a pig of a game tonight anyway he uh, <laughs> he uh, uh, knew just chances unfortunately came against Matt Murray and he got two of them and the first one yeah, McDavid stole the puck and they came in two on one and he set up Nuge perfectly as you would expect and Nuge had that thing and got away, you know, pretty good accurate shot but by the time it was off his stick uh, Murray was in position to make the stop and the second one I remember was just a couple of minutes after that and it was another really good setup in the slot and we didn't record it because it wasn't a shot on goal and it wasn't a shot on goal because this time the defenseman had time to adjust and get his stick in the lane and tip it into the netting so it was no chance at all in the end, but it was a chance where a real quick, er, you know, early release uh, would have been not just a shot on goal, but very possibly a shot in the goal. And I'm not sure that's something that, I mean, he's a 10-year player now. I'm not sure it's something that's ever going to come in his game. We used to have the same issue with Jordan Everly, or even more so, where Everly would take a pass and then he would dust it off, as Ryan Rashog like to say, you know, he does a little stick handle and then shoot. And Nuge will just take it and hold it and then shoot. So he doesn't do any sort of extra dangling, but it just is that split-second delay, and that split-second in this league is everything. It's a, uh, it's a very difficult and rare skill, because we don't mm-hmm. see many players who have that skill. On the Oilers, Dreisaitl is a, is a one-time, you know, one-timer guy. Pull you Yarvi looks to me like he has the potential to fire that quickly. Um, he doesn't have the accuracy yet of right. dry sidle. Uh, James Neal is a one time shooter. He's really quick to shoot the puck, but he's kind of, he's, he's a bit past that. He doesn't, you know, have the, the speed to keep up with McDavid. Kyler Yamamoto, we've seen him uh, get off some of those shots. He seems mm-hmm. to be working on that, developing that skill. Uh, Chase on can do that now and then, but he's a little slow as well. So there's no, natural Cahoon isn't a one-timer guy he's you know he's not going to move up to the top line and do what Nuge isn't doing so there's is there anyone on the left wing I mean you could try James Neal I guess um in that role but that's a bit of a stretch so Nuge Nuge it is he's getting the chances and you know so 18 grade A shots he should probably have four or five goals um right now instead of two with McDavid setting you up and the fact that a lot of those are kind of, uh, let's say, you know, they are the five alarm chances. He should probably have mm-hmm. at least five, probably five or six goals right now, but he's just not finding a way to score. We'll see if that changes. Alrighty, Bruce. Uh, last year he was, he was uh, slow in the first half and then he absolutely caught fire in the second half. And maybe we'll see him getting hotter as the year goes along to just such sights a little bit and, Start uh, start beating yeah. his goalies again, and once once in a while he does get a good shot for a goal, but those have been on the power play. In the so. first half, he was a center 
um, away from McDavid and Dreisaitl. So, mm-hmm. you know, that he struggled. He's, he's, he struggles in that role. But he had his chances and he wasn't scoring. He had some chances. He, he started to score when he got on the dynamite line. And I think that would get him scoring again. The late lamented dynamite line? Dynamite line. Yeah, no one ever brings that up. I never hear about <laughs> it. All right, uh, Bruce, uh, I just want to say it was, we got some really sad news from about TSN radio today mm-hmm. across Canada. And f- for people like us who actually, uh, this is part of the work that we do. It's kind of a, a sh- little bit uh, chilling to see that happen. I just want to, my heart goes out to those, uh, uh, all of those editors, producers, on-air people at those radio stations. That is a really tough thing. And it's a loss for those communities, for sports fans in those communities. And I, I'm glad that uh, TSN 1260 here in Edmonton was saved uh, from the axe. So yeah, that's a great no work kidding. done over there. And, um, you know, including from... Uh, uh, Alan Mitchell, who's a who's a real close friend of yours, and yes. uh, uh, just a fa- fantastic hockey writer and broadcaster. So, um, uh, kind of a sad moment. Yeah, I listen to TSN almost every day for uh, my ho- during hockey season, especially when when working. You know, like it's an invaluable uh, font of information, uh, and you know that they got. Good, good uh, host from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And unfortunately, you know, they, they had an evening show, but Corey Graham, a uh, uh, local broadcaster, got laid off today. And my heart goes oh, out to Corey geez. and his family. He's had a tough time of it this last while. And with the Oil King season being uh, uh, on the ropes, they, uh, they took that decision. And uh, uh, it, uh, that one really stunned. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. All righty, Bruce. Uh, well, on that note, we uh, have a, uh, there's a big game coming up. Is it Thursday in Montreal? Is that the yeah. next one? So a huge, huge, huge test for the mm-hmm. Edmonton Oilers. How are they going to match up against the team that absolutely, that pretty much dominated them, at least in the one game, totally dominated, dominated them. I think in both games, really, the scoring chances were close in one game, but uh, it's going to be a big test because that big, tough, rugged and skilled Montreal defense. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I've got one skill testing question for you. Who's going to start net for the Oilers on Thursday? Bruce, I would bet. I'm not a betting man. Mm-hmm. I'm not a betting man. I only bet on sure things. Mm-hmm. I would probably be pre- prepared to take a bet. It would be Mike Smith. I don't have very much doubt about that at all. Smith. Yeah. It, Dave Tippett likes Mike Smith a, mm-hmm. a lot. And Mike Smith just played fantastic hockey. And the Oilers yeah. looked fantastic in that game. Yeah, they sure played a lot better last night than they did tonight, which is an ongoing observation. I'm sort of wanting to keep a running track this year after, you know, looking at the stats at the end of last year and going, holy crap, the artists did better with uh, Mike Smith in that than they did with Koskinen. Goaltending aside, like the goaltending itself, Koskinen was the better stopper. We should but see they always how... seem to be the better team with Smith. So I, I'm thinking they'll go Smith on Thursday and that way Koskinen will get a few days where he can concentrate on on his uh, technique. I mean, he didn't get much time ice time with the goalie coach, uh, Dustin Schwartz, and, and uh, uh, he's got to work on, on stopping those those holes, filling those holes, and a, a little bit of time to just work on his technical game is uh, what the doctor ordered for Miko. Like that, that's, uh, uh, it's by no means a bad thing for him that if there's this, another goalie that's uh, going to crowd the crease for competition. Yeah, Mike Smith, I just, his passing was like a revelation all of a sudden to see him. Because when it's going well, when his passing is going well, it's mm-hmm. really going well and it really works for your team. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes he makes that, you know, I think Brian Burke said it was like five times a year. And I think that's about right where he makes the goal causing error. I don't even know if it was that many last year. But there, he does make that mistake now and then. But it sure makes a difference when, when it's going. Um, just helping out the defense, moving the puck upsetting the flow of the other team and they're you know where are they going to go what what can they do it makes the orders a lot less predictable in terms of advancing the puck out of their zone mm-hmm. um, because smith is just so clever with it and uh just it just really hit me hard especially then seeing Koskin again this game where where that wasn't there and you're just wondering okay just seems all a little less uncertain and a little harder for everybody 
um, when the defense don't have to do all the work advancing the puck or most of it, because Koskinen does play the puck as well. And he was getting better last year as he watched Smith, but that kind of went out the window, I think, earlier this year. I hadn't seen it. I haven't seen it as much. So, uh, yeah, I think there's something there, Bruce, and it is worth watching. And we could even track grady chances in the game Smith plays as compared to the games Koskinen plays and see if there's a, a difference. All right, you got the game grades. Let's leave it there You're for good. now. All right. Thanks, thanks for, for talking. Listen. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Bruce. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.